Welcome back to the Createx stage at Virtual COGEX. A special welcome to those of you who are new to the stage. The Createx stage is hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by Facebook, UKRI, More Kingston Smith and Digital Catapult. COGEX is all about community. And if the Creative Industries is the community you want to belong to, just email us at createx at thecreativeindustries.co.uk and we'll make sure to keep you involved. This is our last session on the Createx 2020 stage at COGEX, and I have a feeling we may have saved the best till last. Because in true Createx spirit, it's forward facing, it's collaborative, and it's designed to cross the generational divide and bring on the talent of the future. This last session is curated by BPI. BPI is the association which represents the UK's recorded music industry which is one of the most exciting and thriving music sectors in the world. British artists account for one in eight albums purchased by fans around the globe. Their membership includes more than 400 independent music companies and the UK's major record companies, Universal Music, Sony Music, Warner Music UK. Together, their members account for 85% of all music sold in the United Kingdom. BPI also organises the annual Brit Awards. Wow, seriously impressive. And there's more. Working in partnership with Music Alley, BPI are now launching a new initiative to support new music talent and new music tech startups get off the ground faster, better and easier. Over to them to tell you more. A big welcome to Stuart Dredge, Editor-in-Chief, Music Alley and Friends. Hello. Hey, thank you for tuning in. Um, yeah, my name's Stuart. I'm a journalist in the UK and the editor at Music Ally. Uh, we're a music industry company that does various things like training and events and consultancy. Um, but I do journalism side of things, reporting on the music industry and the technology in and around it. Um, and there's a lot of backstory to this today. So, I mean, ever since it's been an industry, the music industry has been driven by new tech. Um, back to the earliest means of performing music, instruments, recording music, playing it back. Um, and then more recently, the technology for downloading and streaming it. Um, so we're not going to shirk the difficult issues today. The relationship between music and tech has sometimes been a bit rocky. So when Napster and file sharing came along in the late 1990s, it sparked fear and loathing and lawsuits. Um, although actually there were people in the music industry at the time who thought it should be embraced and licensed. So even then, it wasn't just music versus tech. There were people in music who were trying to embrace the disruptive technology. Um, and then a decade later, Spotify figured out how to get that idea of all the music on demand licensed and launched. And that kicked off the era of streaming music, which has returned the music industry to growth. But it's also sparked heated debates about how it model pays off for artists and songwriters, not just for companies. Um, and Spotify was once just a tiny startup in Sweden with big ideas. And that's kind of the spark for today's session, how the music industry works with startups of all kinds. Um, and I'd say now more than ever, the industry wants to welcome innovation in. It's not just licensing startups, but it's increasingly incubating and investing in them too. Um, right now, Music Ally, we've been looking at things like the impact of AI for creating music, for analyzing it, tagging it, even for identifying new talent. AI is a &R. Uh, New Horizons are opening up in gaming and virtual reality. So there are no concerts happening at the moment in many countries, as you know. But Fortnite really recently hosted a concert attended by nearly 28 million people. So music industry is trying to work out how a game's a new concerts. Um, artists are trying to figure out how live stream video can help them. We've had a bajillion conference panels on blockchain technology and what that means for music. A uh, few of us are many of the wise, and I'm quite relieved we're not talking too much about that today. Um, but our panelists are wiser. Um, they're some of the people who've really been engaged with this. And all four, all four of us recently took part in this project that Music Ally launched with BPI. Um, it's called the Music and Tech Springboard, and it's a series of videos where experts like labels and lawyers and advisors and startups give advice to new startups on how to start working with the music industry. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about some of the issues raised in those videos uh, and then just kick around some of this exciting, disruptive technology and what it means for music. Um, so I'm going to introduce everyone first briefly. Then we're going to talk to them individually about their experiences and what, and what they've learned. And then we're going to all come back together and kind of kick around some of these issues. Um, so I'm going to come first to Isabel. Um, so do you want to say a little bit about yourself and what you do and where you are? Yes, uh, I'm Isabel Garvey. I'm the managing director of Abbey Road Studios. And in the context of our discussion today, I'm representing Abbey Road Red, which is our music tech incubator, which we set up five years ago uh, and more of that later. And right now I'm 
sitting in my wardrobe, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a one-upmanship. Who's sitting in the room? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, and I come to Cliff now. So Cliff, you work with startups in a couple of ways. So introduce yourself and what, what you do. Yes, my name is Cliff Fluet. I am um, been in and around the world of digital media and digital music since the mid-1990s when I was at a label and saw the internet arrive. I've worked in broadcast. The last come out to 15 years, I've been a partner at the law firm, Lewis Silkian, and I also run an advisory firm where I advise clients in digital media called Eleven. Thank you. And uh, Chantal, um, you're here representing the entirety of music startups, all of them. Um, so <laughs> wow. tell us about yourself and, the, and your startup. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Chantal Epp, and I'm the founder and CEO of Click and Clear. We are a music startup. Um, we deliver officially licensed music to performance sports worldwide. We're very much tackling untapped revenue and finding ways to tackle copyright infringement effectively and affordably whilst uh, bringing in new revenue streams for the music industry. Grand stuff. So we have three people basically. Uh... Isabel, who's working with startups, helping them get talk to them, who's work with them. Cliff works still up on an advisory basis and helps them sign deals and kind of things. And Chantal has signed those deals and has been building a business that relies on music. So it's a really good mix. Um, so I guess let's talk individually for a little bit and then we'll come back together. And I'm going to start with Isabel, um, continuing the order, really. Um, so Isabel, Abbey Road, which is obviously the most famous recording studio I can think of. Yeah. Which has been, and the thing I know about it, and we've talked before about this, is the fact that it, technology's always been part of it, like right back to when the Beatles were doing weird things with tape in, in the big yeah. studio. But tell me how and why Abbey Road took that step into not just kind of using music recording technology, but kind of working with startups and incubating and doing stuff. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, as you've alluded to, we have this fantastic history of innovation at the studio. You know, even going further back into the 30s, few people realised that, you know, Alan Bloomline did his uh, experimentation with stereo sound uh, up at Abbey Road way before it was even commercially available. And as you say, right the way through to recording techniques with the Beatles, you know, we were, the, the, you know, I know we're going to take a talk about AI later. There was a moment in time where people thought the synthesizer was the beginning of the end of music. And actually we kind of rode through with that wave and it kind of defined a new genre of music. Um, and so I joined Abbey Road five years ago, and one of my um, challenges looking at the studio was, well, how do we ensure, at the time, I think we were 87 years old, how do we make sure um, the studio is still the top studio in the world in another 87 years? And we knew that technology was the key to that. I mean, all of us here today know that technology influences how an artist prepares before they come into a studio. Um, and also what they do once they leave. So we knew that we needed to think about technology in a, in a new way in terms of connecting our brand to it, but also just understanding what the, what the new, um, new technology coming out is, what the new trends are so that we could be part of the change rather than have the change happen to us. And we did a very detailed search of the music tech landscape at the time five years ago and my, my personal history I've worked in kind of did on the digital side of music for um, almost the entirety of my career um, and I was somewhat skeptical of what we would find but actually at the time there was kind of a step change in technology and we found a really rich landscape of startups and we thought actually you know Abbey Road is beautifully somewhat music Switzerland and we were perfectly placed to um, actually create um, uh, an incubator or, or a setup where we could really support grassroots businesses as I say try to grow into the industry and make the connections and we have that benefit of being connected to an artist base so musicians who will want to play with the technology but also with Universal as a parent company into the major record labels and publishers and you know the lovely the lovely people like Cliff who who are you know deeper connectors to finance and to legal um, and so actually we had a really relevant part to play in um in helping young businesses um get going really okay and what kind of startups do you work with i mean has it been a i mean obviously you have cast a wide net but have there what have been the particular areas you're looking at? is it all related to recording music or has it been all kinds of stuff no we very consciously looked across the whole value chain um so uh we 
we obviously have a, a personal vested interest in stuff that's very close to music creation. But again, with the parent company and we have a, a set of, I think we're at 30 plus mentors who help us with our incubation program. We really can uh, affect change and, and support businesses right across the value chain. I mean, for example, we've had, you know, we've had businesses from lyric generation engines to music education to vinyl e-commerce. We've had some hardware. We have some rights tech, tech um, and right the way through to kind of AI led startups. That, and those have been more on the music composition and production end. But we've seen a whole gamble. We're 15 businesses in in five years and we've seen a, a real variety of businesses and really encouraged by uh, the, the new angles, the new the new commercial opportunities and the new tech that we're seeing. Hmm. No, great. So what, I mean, this is a massive question, but what have you learned from watching those startups interact with the music industry? Like, What have you learned about what they need, what the music industry, like, because I know there have been some really fertile relationships created out of it, but yeah, what have been mm -hmm. the key lessons that have been kind of made you encouraged? Um, I think, I mean, it's very hard to generalise because each business is so different, but um, I, I think... Um, Typically, what we see is is we startups underestimate the complexity of this industry quite a lot, and particularly the rights flows. So that's where we've been able to add a huge amount of value to those businesses to help them navigate those challenges and also kind of make sure that they they make the right connections. Um, another thing we see is that some startups think that they're solving problems, but that but that they don't really exist. In fact, the businesses we we've, we've seen excel are those that are kind of as have very simple concepts that are and that are kind of supported by a true understanding of the nuances of the business and and leaders and and um, CEOs that have the patience to learn and to to understand all of these subtleties of the business, and um, rather than thinking they can come in with a quick fix. And then on a very personal level, I mean, I've learned a huge amount of about tech, but also um, what makes a good leader, how tenacious these startups need to be, the resilience they need to have and the enthusiasm. And it's um, it's it's really, it's just really vibrant and, and uh, life affirming to be around. Mm, fantastic. Well, cool. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move across to Chris now. Um, and obviously you're involved in Abbey Road Red, but you also advise something. But I mean, well, you advise startups on how to deal with the music industry, and I'm kind of hoping we can all have some free advice now. <laughs> I mean, what are the key things you find startups need to learn about the music industry? I mean, Isabel talked about understanding the complexity and being flexible. What have you kind of noticed? Yeah, well, as for free advice, Stu, it's like a free lunch. It doesn't exist. So, uh, <laughs> But turning to your question about startups working the, the music industry, I suppose there's three core things I often sort of have to speak to startups about. And number one is understanding the music industry. Um, people come in with a very set idea as to what the music industry is, and it rarely collides with actually what it is. And on a good day, it's an ecosystem. And it's one that's both sophisticated and complex. It's built up over years and years and years with many interdependent stakeholders. And lots of people may come in with their likes or their prejudices or their views, but it rarely collides with the reality. So uh, on a bad day, it's, it's a tribe of warring houses, a bit like Game of Thrones, but <laughs> there you are. Um, another thing I would say, touching on what Isabel said, and my background as a lawyer as well is that, you know, rights is not an annoyance that technology can spirit away. There's a lot of uh, startups that can come into the business thinking, right, okay, I can cure rights. Um, and you understand- When we talk about rights, that's, we should make it clear to me, that that's like the, the rights to use the recordings, to yes, use the that's songs. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, and the rights, you know, third party rights, copyrights. But the irony is, is that these companies will often, you know, defend or respect or even venerate patents or confidential information or their trademarks. But actually there seems to be the sense of, you know, some people seeing music rights as fuel uh, without understanding that is what the business, that's what its lifeblood is. And actually the whole business is built upon coming out with value based upon licensing. And I suppose that's the last thing I would say is that actually that startups, the ones that focus upon bringing value rather than taking value, are you a maker or a taker to the industry? And you find that if you come to the industry as a maker, you get far more traction. And there are some people who want to come in and want to do a Napster and blow it all up. But actually, there aren't that many examples of those people being very, very successful. 
And you'll find that the most successful startups in the industry are the ones that have brought value to the industry rather than necessarily taking it away. They might have changed the business model. They might have found a new way of being able to monetize and value. And that's what ultimately leads to where we are now. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, where where are the gaps and where are the where is the over kind of saturation? Because I remember a time when every single startup I met was like, yeah, we've got an app for discovering new music. And you'd ask them what the business model was and they'd look a bit panicked and run away. But that's kind of every way a bit. Like where where do we, where are the things we need more startups? Where are the areas maybe where we have quite a few already? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of people that have been focusing on, I don't know, how something like AI could replace artists and record companies and all of that stuff. And also there's, I think the world doesn't necessarily need another Spotify. It doesn't need to have an all catalog, all access service. So what we're now doing is seeing that there are startups and services that are trying to bring something else and understand and bring value to the wider music ecosystem. So you've got some startups like AI Music that can shape change music, some that can adapt music for ads like Score. There's ones that can make music videos like Rota. You can use mobile and um, on-device contextual AI to personalize. You can use AI in order to understand the sentiment behind lyrics. You can use businesses in order to understand where the rights gaps and the flows are. There's so many areas, there's so many gaps. I think the solving the access to constant on-demand music, that's been very, very well addressed. How do you make it more personal? How do you make it more pertinent? How do you deliver more value? How do you make it audiovisual? How do you make it more sticky? Those are the problems that technology companies are dealing with and growing. The ones that do, the startups that are working in those zones are growing significantly. I'd also observe actually they've done very, very well during lockdown is that while the yeah. music industry has been unable to attack you know, live or broadcast or shows, which was its predominant one, I've seen these businesses absolutely bloom in the last nine weeks like they haven't before. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good sign. Uh, this this idea of a silver lining of lockdown has come across a few times recently. Um, Grant, we're going to move to Chantal now um, for a startup's perspective. Um, so you kind of mentioned Click and Clear briefly. Um, I guess with the elevator pitch, you are licensing music in a way that hasn't maybe been licensed before. So that's kind of a, a new use for, for the catalog that Cliff's talking about. Yeah, definitely. We, we basically found new revenue stream. So a few years ago, a major label sued the cheerleading industry for infringing on their copyright by editing and adapting music into a mix to accompany their routines. And at the time, I was working in music licensing in the sync world, putting music mostly for online and digital content. Um, and but also working in sort of TV and advertising and so on and so forth. But I'm also a cheerleader myself um, and I still am an active athlete in the sport. And so when that lawsuit happened, I was in a perfect position to create a solution to that problem. Uh, I also have a music production company that mixes music for cheerleading and dance. Uh, and so put my licensing knowledge together with my knowledge of creating music mixes and then the use case of being an athlete, being a cheerleader who uses music at competition to, to create this solution. And we work directly with record labels and publishers to clear a unique set of rights that are required, including adaptation rights, choreography rights, and there's elements of live streaming, video on demand, and, and so on and so forth. So it's quite a complex issue um, at many different levels, and there's many different kind of end users in a way that will form part of the ecosystem. Um, but it's Kind of going what going back to what Cliff said, it's it's very much an added value to the music industry. It's it's a revenue stream that no label or publisher is monetizing in currently. Okay, and like you say, you have that background of you know the sports and performance industry, but you also know licensing. Because I was going to ask you how. Well, I suppose you weren't when you set up Click and Clear. You weren't a novice in licensing at all. You've been doing it for a long time. How did you set about? going in and getting those licenses like what as a startup did you find did you find the door was open were they welcoming did you have to kind of barge a bit to get in how did you start that process off yeah it was it was a bit of both you know i did have experience in licensing so i was fortunate that i kind of knew and understood a little bit about how it worked with master and publishing rights um i of course read the lawsuit very thoroughly i actually approached the lawyers that represented the label in that lawsuit to in, in kind of creating our heads of agreements. Um, and I just started reaching out to the labels and publishers that I had relationships with. So I kind of started out small, 
But at the same time, I was having conversations with the majors to see if they'd even entertain the idea before I actually started embarking on this journey. And they were all very open armed. Um, it, there was very little resistance. Um, I think everyone, I think almost every email I'd get back was, oh, this is a very interesting business you've got here. And it was really just a case of working out the rights because they are sensitive rights, adaptation rights attend, um, tend to be or tend to require approval from the writers. And actually, in some cases, we can't do deals with, with some of the publishers because they simply don't represent those rights or they'd have to go and get approval from every single writer on their roster. So we do still have challenges, but we've signed over 400 labels and publishers to date now, and we have almost all the majors on board. Mm. No, so it's definitely like one of the things about start one is tangible progress is actually what deals have you done? Um, and yeah. a lot of people will like talks are kind of easy, but signing the deals is a sign that it's really been done. So um, the last thing I was going to ask you in this bit was was about how you balance it all, because I know a lot of tech startups outside music, they're trying to balance product development and marketing growth and also then fundraising. Um, in music, I feel like there's those two things, development, marketing, fundraising, but then also licensing. Like, has that been something where you've had to, how have you, I suppose, how have you approached that, making sure you can keep the lights on, keep the funding coming in while also keeping the negotiations going? Is that an interesting challenge? Yeah, it's it's a really, really big challenge. And I think it's it's tough for music tech companies because unlike most industries, we have that additional um, hurdle to sort of jump over with regards to, to rights licensing. And it's very time consuming. You know, some of these deals, take more than two years to put in place and you have to make sure you have the funding to do that and you know I'll be honest I thought it would happen quicker and it didn't um so I in terms of advice I mean I would recommend that you plan for at least two years of two years of no revenue until you can maybe officially launch with all of the catalog that you're that you're wanting to to to, to kind of use on your platform um, but also be careful about spending in marketing too early. I think it's something that we did was we we got kind of a marketing team on board and we didn't really have the product or the, the full solution ready because we didn't have all the rights holders that we needed. And so it massively delayed our launch by probably about a year. Um, and so it's just, it's definitely something that you need to consider and, and be aware of when you're planning in, in the early stages of the business. Yeah, that makes sense. And like that two year, that seems like I mean, I, I've been re reading about from the early days of Spotify and they spent two years basically camping outside labels to their deals like a decade and a bit yeah. ago. It's interesting. Yeah, to I mean, that. it's really tough. And like Spotify, I mean, I often compare ourselves to Spotify in the respect that we're doing something that's never been done before. There's no template hmm. agreement. Like we are creating the very first kind of agreement put in place with these labels and publishers so it, it takes significantly longer you know any streaming company behind Spotify all these labels and publishers have like their startup programs now with a template agreement that they use they can put some test catalog in it's great it's going to take a few months but when you're really doing something different or innovative it, it does take two years because they have to work out how that's going to work with with all of the deals that they've got, maybe they need to actually make some adjustments with all of their future deals, and that means changing all the contracts with their artists and writers, and it really is challenging. Mm, no, no, it's being challenged. But possible. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good thing. Like it is possible. Like it hasn't fallen by the wayside. So, I mean, I guess we're going to open it out, and there's so many things we could talk about. Um, one thing I wanted to do up was AI because I'm. Um, I think both Isabel and Cliff mentioned it. I'm kind of interested in asking Chantal about AI because that would be one way around licensing, get an AI sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> but like, so I mean, it's weird because AI is. There's so many different. It covers everything. It covers machine learning for discovering music. It covers neural networks creating music. Like it's a very too broad catch-all term. But in terms of the music composition side and AI getting involved in creating music, that's a really fun slightly controversial scary but exciting issue is that fair to say like like i know isabel you've had what, public talks and you've had yeah. you've kind of explored some of those uh good tensions i think like what does this mean yeah. for humans i think and i think yeah cliff and i have have lived this together actually <laughs> i think so um you know five years ago i mean first of all ai is kind of omnipresent around us we don't even see it but the the type of ai you're talking about about where can the computer compose 
you know, as well as a human? Is it replacing an artist? I think four or five years ago, it was in that really scary category of like, are the robots taking over? Um, and it's been really interesting watching the evolution because we've been particularly sponsoring businesses looking at AI and, and composition and various different different approaches to it. Um, but what we're seeing now, I, um, particularly in the last 12 and 18 months, is that artists and and uh, labels and everybody in the, the the that are looking that's looking at these businesses is understands the technology a little more and understands the parameters of what it can and can't do because it's not replacing the human. We, you know, why do we connect with the song? It's about the emotional experience and none of us have shared experience with robots yet, right? So, um, so uh, it's not replacing, not but it's really additive. So it goes back to what I said at the start, you know, when, uh, you know, the music industry thought the synthesizer was going to be the beginning of the end, uh, you know, of, of music as we know it. And actually, we see artists certainly uh, playing in the studios that they see AI as actually really enhancing human creativity. They can ideate much faster. They can layer tracks together. They can show producer what they want to do. They can add effects that weren't possible before. Um, and it's it's actually really exciting. And so the 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 language and the rhetoric around AI is now much more about it uh, enhancing creativity rather than being this big dangerous proposition. And that puts us in a brilliant place. And we're seeing lots of really, really exciting businesses coming through then on the back of that. Sorry, Cliff, I've probably waffled. No, 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 it. no, absolutely. <laughs> I, said, I, 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 was, I was nearly attacked um, in Abbey Road three, three years ago by a bunch of engineers. I was as popular <laughs> yes, I remember as Uber, that well. <laughs> I, was, I was as popular as an Uber driver at a cab rank. Um, <laughs> but really, it, it's very, very, very distracting. And it sort of goes to the sort of human condition to talk about the composition element. But actually, mm. it really, really pulls away from actually what it could do for data, what it could do for reconciliation, what it can do for rights, what it could do for payments. The ability as a user for having more personalized experiences, making it more immersive, making it more contextual. All yeah. of the music experiences that people want for the future are going to have to have some kind of algorithmic relationship in order to get the value out, to be able to be created, distributed, dynamic and personalized. And if you look at the most successful companies on the planet, most of which have spoken part of COGX, will show you that they have algorithms in order to make things more efficient, in order to monetize and to be able to do that. And what the TikTok, for example, and ByteDance, who acquired a UK AI music startup called JigTech, you know, but what they're doing with regard to music, they're actually creating a whole new paradigm. And it's not mm -hmm. affected Spotify use. It's not affected, compo and it's not put any composers out of business. It's created a whole new value which is what has happened as you started with all of music tech and the music industry. The piano was music tech. Yeah. A violin was music tech. I had to explain to some people, think about a piano, I hit a button and a noise comes out and it doesn't come from me. And there's no conversation about whether or not the piano can own the, the music or not. So I'm a bit bored of the composition. I'm really, really interested in the contextual and what AI does for that. Mm. Definitely. I mean, it's a bit unfair to come to you, Sandra, because you're not an AI music starter. But I guess no, but we actually use AI. Okay, how do you use um, AI? Yeah, so we've we started working with Amusio, um, who who tag music and have a search kind of platform, and that's to help us with the searchability of the music on the platform. You know, we're working with big labels and publishers, with big artists, um, and we need to help our users find the music that they're looking for. They'll often you know, have a sort of, they'll know the song that they're looking for and it might be, well, we need to find something that's similar on the platform if it's not available. Um, so it's it's really to help the discovery process um, mm. very much like how Spotify uses it really. And curating mm. the playlist too is a really big important one. We, we curate yeah. the playlist, but I don't have enough people <laughs> to, to be doing that manually. I'd much rather an AI does that for us. Mm. No, definitely. And like as this famous stat, isn't it like 40,000 new songs are uploaded to Spotify every day? And like AI is becoming hugely important in town and trying to make sense of all that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, well, the last question I go is we've got five minutes left. Was <clears throat> where are there still challenges still? We kind of talked a little bit about, I suppose, the time it takes to get a deal, the complexity of the industry. Are there things that the music industry can can still be working at? Let's do this constructively. Well, how can the music industry be even better at working with startups? Like where what are the to-dos do you think for the next year or two? Um, I'll let you take that, whoever um, wants to jump in. 
Yeah, from my perspective, it's having a better idea of the rights, um, maybe improving on rights tech. I know it's always a big, a big topic of conversation and everyone's always talked about a global rights management database. Um, but as a startup, we actually had to build our own rights management database for internal use so that we could ingest metadata from rights holders. And you wouldn't believe how many rights holders don't actually have their own metadata. They have mm -hmm. to get it from a third party. And, and even still, we can't get that data. So we'll do deals with someone. And for two years, we still don't have the data to then monetize on the content. So what was the point of doing the deal? Um, so I think that that's a really big area. And part of that is just down to data, like having the data and, and inputting that correctly. And then rights tech, you know, for having technology, having startups that can better manage and match all of those, um, all of that data into a system. Yeah. That idea of like, what music actually do you own or represent and being able to give that data to someone, it sounds like, a really, I don't think like, again, one of those, those things where it sounds like an obvious simple thing, but then when you get into working with this industry, you realize it's not quite as simple as that. Yeah, <laughs> and I think the other thing is it's just so fragmented. There's so many people, there's like on average nine writers on every hit song. So is there a bit better way maybe uh, through legislation that we can change the approval process so you can have like more than whoever owns more than 50% has the final say on approval. I mean, we do that with businesses. So why don't we do that with copyright? Um, mm -hmm. You know, things like that could be interesting to explore. Yeah, okay. I think I think to take us out of the grassroots of rights because you know it it is a quagmire <laughs> and um, another hour, isn't it? There's, there's some rights tech that uh, that helps alleviate some of the pain points that uh, we're talking about. I think you know the industry has has always embraced innovation. I think it's and it's getting much faster at doing proof of concepts. Um, mm -hmm. so I I think that if the industry can keep you know a pace with where all these really exciting and and sometimes slightly adjacent pieces of technology are coming up and embracing proof of concepts, and then mm -hmm. certainly from our perspective, like we run a hackathon every year, and you know I, I'm I'm open to take any topic that industry wants to put in front of really bright developers to just try and hack to, through you know either either problems or just exciting consumer propositions. Yeah. So I think there's 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 plenty there's plenty of problems still in the kind of the big institution that is music, but I think there's a real energy to embrace tech, which is that uh, which is exciting. Yeah. And for me, I think it's a combination of those. Um, I think that actually, you know, what Chantel sort of pointed out is a perfect machine learning problem. It's, yeah. A, you know, we should be throwing the tech at the solutions rather than so the music industry shouldn't always see a startup as a license as a licensee, yeah. which is probably how I think that they approach all mm -hmm. tech. Saying, what do you have for me? It's like, well, what do we have for you? And then also beyond that, taking it to where it sits with music and wellness, where it sits with music and commerce. How do we yeah. actually create new spaces to create and consume, be that in car or be that on Internet of Things or on smart devices? There's so much more. The pie is of an infinite scale. And what yeah. will get us there is technology. Mm. I've been doing the thing this week, not to talk, crack on about my, my lockdown habits, but I've been doing VR boxing. Um, one of those games <laughs> where you're kind of punching thin air with a computer strapped to your face. But music is intrinsic to that. I'm spending an hour uh, a day with music. And what I want now is for them to have all the music I love in it. And they obviously have, you know, building a catalog. Like there are all these other places doing stuff with music now that's exciting. So Grand, well, I mean, that's been our discussion and it's been really cool. And I think, so not to throw plugs at everyone, but um, if there are startups watching this, um, the Music and Tech Springboard with the BPI, it's hopefully a really good introduction. It's kind of attacking some of those problems, how to approach labels, all this stuff we've talked about. Um, but otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you, Cogex, for inviting us. And uh, thank you to the panelists. I'm really sort of pleased to have the conversation. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thanks to you, Stuart, Isabel, Chantal, and Cliff. You exceeded expectations. How exciting to see how the music industry is mastering tech. So again, for you makers out there starting out, just a plug for the program, BPI in association with Music Ally. Check out the name Music and Tech Springboard Program. It's all there to help you, plus the individuals you've seen on the screen today. So I'd just like to spend a few minutes summing up what's been a, a wonderful three days at COGX. We've so enjoyed our three days on the Createx stage where creativity meets technology 
at the COGETS Virtual Festival for AI and Breakthrough Technologies. It's been exciting to be part of the biggest, most inclusive and forward-thinking gathering of leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, policymakers, artists, academics and activists of its kind. It's our first year and I'm hoping we'll be invited back. The theme of this year's festival has been how do you get the next 10 years right? And for us in the creative industries in the UK, that means how do we invent, master and manage a new world where creativity meets technology? And right now, how do we manage recovery and renewal of our cultural institutions and outlets post COVID-19? The Createx stage has been hosted by the Creative Industries Council and supported by Facebook, UKRI, more Kingston Smith and Digital Catapult. We've had an amazing three days. On day one, we open with Tim Davey and Caroline Dinich, MP, setting out their vision for the UK creative industries. We launched our Createc 100s Ones to Watch and showcased many of them on our stage and in the Createc Expo booths. We debated the challenges and opportunities surrounding emerging tech and the metaverse, explored funding for R&D and innovation, discuss finance for startups and scale-ups, and the digital future of art, AI in entertainment, and living through fiction. We started day two reflecting on how COVID-19 has helped UK televisions fight back, boosted Facebook communities, and accelerated a sketch-to-story view of the global fashion market. We explored how the new tools of engagement like voice, AR, MR, VR would enhance engagement with marketing, entertainment and education experiences for audiences of the future. And we talked with event organisers and production companies about lessons learned from live events turning virtual during the pandemic. Today's agenda has taken a slightly different turn. While the pandemic is still ever present in our thoughts, we are beginning to look forward, preparing for recovery, getting ready for the upturn opening up to new business development opportunities. The subtext for this morning's program was where East meets West. We were entertained by TikTok, educated about how China and Europe are feeling and behaving as they come out of lockdown. We were briefed on how the Department for International Trade was supporting create tech businesses to explore new export and investment opportunities, and how DCMS was beginning the process of supporting cultural institutions to survive and thrive. And this afternoon, we've heard what the digital future looks like for the performing arts, publishing and music. We end Create 2020 on an optimistic and respectful note. As Minister Stewart said, our UK creative talent leads the world. We have the creativity, ingenuity and determination to innovate, innovate and pivot. And as McCann's Harjo Singh's cultural study showed, we have the human spirit and purpose to reinvent, imagine, and recreate our future scape. Our 100 Create wants to watch demonstrate we have new leaders coming through. So, what more can we say? I hope that the sense of creative community we've built over the last three days on the Create stage will continue and grow and serve as an ever present reminder of what we can do when we set our minds to it. Thank you, COGEX, for allowing us to share in your virtual festival. Thank you to Eleanor and James for persuading us to join. Thank you to the production team, Mazzy, Claire, Matt, Steph and Gemma, and Lisa Marie and Tamama for keeping our show on the road. Thank you to all of you in our virtual audience for your participation. And a special thank you to my team, Jane, Carlos, Rachel and Jana, who have been tireless in their commitment to the programme after the last 10, over the last 10 weeks. Job done. Now the virtual celebration begins. Want access to more COGEX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogex.co.